Okay, so in the previous videos, what we've been talking about is uh, bonds that form between atoms. This is going to allow us to describe reactions eventually. Um, what we've used to describe bonds are called Lewis dot structures. Electrons are present in bonds, and we can use Lewis dot structures to depict those bonds. But at the most fundamental level, the best way to describe bonding is using orbitals and molecular orbital theory. So that's what we're going to talk about in this lecture. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about atomic orbitals. Atomic orbitals can combine to form hybrid orbitals, and atomic and or hybrid orbitals can overlap to form bonds, and we need to use molecular orbital theory and molecular orbitals to describe that bonding. So let's start off with atomic orbitals. Um, as you will hopefully recall from general chemistry, there's several different types of atomic orbitals in this class. Luckily for us, we're only going to talk about two kinds. We're going to talk about s orbitals and p orbitals. So notice that your s orbital is going to be spherical. Um, this usually is lower in energy, so it's going to fill first um, with electrons. Then you have your p orbitals. These are often referred to as dumbbell shaped. Um, they have a node at right here and right here and right here, meaning that that's an area of zero probability of finding an electron. The phase of the orbital changes. Remember that an orbital is a description of the wave function of an electron. We're not going to get too technical here, but remember a wave can have um, phases, either a positive or a negative phase like we've depicted here. So you have a positive phase and a negative phase and a positive phase and a negative phase. The same thing with an orbital. An orbital is going to be an area of high likelihood of finding an electron. So we're likely to find an electron here in a p orbital, and we're likely to find an electron here in that same p orbital, but not so much right here. This has nothing to do with charge, so the plus and the minus has nothing to do with charge. Remember that, like I said, the s orbital is usually lower in energy than the p orbital. The lowest energy orbital, atomic orbital, is going to be the 1s. So we fill that first, we put one electron in for hydrogen. We pair electrons in the same energy orbital for helium. We have two electrons in this, so we have to go to the next highest energy, 2s. We put one electron in, then we pair it in beryllium. We can write this as electron configurations. This is a 1s, 1 electron configuration. This is a 1s, 2 electron configuration, meaning there's two electrons in the 1s orbital. This is a 1s, 2, 2s, 1. This is a 1s, 2, 2s, 2 electron configuration. Hopefully this is ringing a bell. Okay, so now what we're going to start doing is combining electrons and combining orbitals to make bonds. Here is one of the most simple cases. You have a hydrogen atom combining with another hydrogen atom to form a bond between those two hydrogen atoms. Remember, each hydrogen atom has one electron, so we can form a bond between those two hydrogens um, and H2. So what does this look like if we use molecular orbital theory? Remember, we have an s orbital here which is spherical shaped, and we have an s orbital here that's spherical shaped. Each hydrogen atom has one electron that we use we use these little arrows to depict those single electrons. It's actually lower in energy for those both to go into a sigma bonding orbital. So when the two hydrogen atoms see one another, a lower energy configuration, you can actually release energy by forming a bond between these two hydrogen atoms and forming a sigma bond between those two overlapping s orbitals. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is hybrid orbitals. Um, remember, the electron configuration for carbon is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. The p orbitals are 90 degrees from one another, but if we look at methane, Notice that the angles between the CH bonds are 109.5 degrees. So we're not actually using S or P orbitals to make these bonds between the carbons and the hydrogens. What we're using are hybrid orbitals or some mixture 
between these s and p orbitals. How do we do that? Well, if we remember what I said, the electron configuration for carbon, we have two electrons in the 1s orbital, we have two electrons in the 2s, and we have these two unpaired electrons in the 2p. Since these electrons are already paired, they don't want to bond to one another, but we can release more energy if we form more bonds. So what the carbon atom decides to do is hybridize its orbitals. What it does is it pays a little bit of an energetic penalty to move this electron up into the 2p orbital, as we're sh showing here, and then we combine a 2s orbital with our 2p orbitals, so we get all equal energy orbitals, which we're going to call sp3 orbitals. So we have one electron in each of these sp3 orbitals, so now we can form four bonds from overlap of one of these sp3 orbitals with a different orbital that contains an unpaired electron. Okay, so let's, let's draw a picture of methane here. So if we want to draw, if we take an s orbital and a p and a p and a p, and we combine those, what we get is S4 sp3 hybridized orbitals, which looks something like this. You have four lobes, and each one has one electron in it. So we have four, one, two, three, four sp3 hybridized orbitals. Now, if we have methane, we have a carbon that has these four sp3 hybridized orbitals and like I said on the previous slide we have one electron in each one of these orbitals and then each hydrogen atom has an s orbital has one electron in it so that the overlap between the s orbital of the hydrogen and the sp3 orbital of the carbon is going to be this bond. The, each one of these is a sigma bond Sigma bond results from a head-on overlap between an S, this sp3 orbital and this s orbital. So if you have an s, sp3, and an s overlapping, we're going to call that a sigma bond. Here's a much better picture that I stole from the book. So if you look here, we have our sp3 hybridized carbon. We have our three, our four hydrogen atoms. Each one is s, it has an s orbital, so we're going to overlap the s orbital with the sp3 orbital. We're going to have two electrons in that bond, two electrons in that bond, two electrons, two electrons. Tetrahedral geometry. A hallmark of sp3 hybridized carbon is this bond angle of 109.5 degrees. Okay. So let's look at another example here. We have, the first thing I like to do is draw the Lewis dot structure. We have ammonia here, and the ammonia atom, you need hybrid orbitals to accommodate bonds and lone pairs of electrons. So you have one, two, three, four. So you need four hybrid orbitals in order to accommodate those four groups of electrons. So nitrogen is going to be sp3 hybridized. And we're going to have two electrons in this one. We're going to have one here. We're going to have one here. And we're going to have one here. And then those sp3 hybridized orbitals are going to overlap with the s orbitals of our hydrogens. And each one of those orbitals is going to have an electron in it. We have a three sigma bonds here for our three NH bonds. So each one of these is a sigma bond resulting from an sp3 orbital overlapping with an s orbital. And the hybridization on nitrogen is sp3. We need four orbitals, one for the lone pair and three for each one of these bonds. Okay, so there's several different types of hybridization. The next type we're going to talk about is sp2 hybridization. What can happen in this case is that an atom can decide to combine an s orbital with two p orbitals, so that's what this sp2 means, and leave one p orbital unhybridized or not affected, as it says here. So you have three 
equal energy sp2 hybridized orbitals. A picture, a bad picture of an sp2 hybrid orbital would be would look like this. You have a 120 degree bond angle. And perpendicular to this, you have a p orbital that's coming in and out of the screen that's not hybridized. Okay, so let's look at ethylene. If we draw the Lewis dot structure, it looks like this. Notice that in this particular case, we can easily determine the hybridization of the atom by just deciding how many atoms that it's bonded to. So carbon, this carbon is bonded to one, two, three different atoms. It needs three hybrid orbitals to make those three bonds. So this is sp2 hybridized. And similarly, this one is sp2 hybridized. So if we draw a picture of that, what we have is a carbon. It's sp2 hybridized. You have three orbitals. They're 120 degrees apart. Each one has one electron in it. This is overlapping with the s orbital of a hydrogen. This one is overlapping with an s orbital of a hydrogen. You have another carbon here that has sp2 hybridization. So this is another sigma bond resulting from two sp2 hybrid, hybrid orbitals overlapping. Then you have here is a bond, here is a bond. So that's the sigma bonding network. But notice that we have a double bond here. Where does that arise from? Well, we have a p orbital on this carbon. We have a p orbital on this carbon. And they're overlapping side to side. That's our pi bond. Each one of these orbitals has one electron in it. So the double bond here is composed of one sigma and one pi bond. The sigma bond is resulting from two sp2 hybrid orbitals overlapping. The pi bond is from two p orbital, two p orbitals overlapping side on. A much better picture of this again. Here we have our two sp2 hybrid orbitals overlapping one another, and then we have our two p orbitals side on overlapping. So this is our pi bond here. This one is our sigma here. Like I just said, your pi bond is going to be weaker than your sigma bond because you don't have very much overlap here. Notice there's not a lot of overlap between these two p orbitals. It's weaker and it's from side on or side to side overlap is what um, defines a pi bond. Okay, the last one that we're going to talk about is sp hybridization. And as the name might suggest, when you combine an s orbital and one p orbital, you get sp hybridization. In the process, you leave two p orbitals unhybridized. So um, instead of drawing a picture of this, what I'm going to do is show you a picture because it's much easier. Notice that sp hybrid carbon is going to be two orbitals that are 180 degrees apart. You have one, two sp orbitals overlapping with one, two here. So the overlap of these two sp orbitals is your sigma bond. You have one, two perpendicular p orbitals, and you have one, two perpendicular p orbitals here. So the side on overlap between these two is one pi bond, and the side on overlap between these two is your other pi bond. So with a triple bond, you have carbon triple bonded to another carbon. You can have one sigma and two pi's. Okay, so what did we learn here? We want to be able to understand the shapes of s and p orbitals. Those are atomic orbitals. Um, they're going to be filled according to the Aufbau principle, and we're going to use the periodic table in order to guide um, where those electrons go. Molecular orbitals form when different orbitals overlap. Those can be atomic orbitals, or those can be hybrid orbitals, or some mixture of the two. We can combine atomic orbitals to make molecular orbitals in either sigma or pi bonds. Sigma bonds are going to be from head-on atomic overlap 
atomic orbital overlap, whereas pi bonds are going to be side to side, as we just discussed. And we're going to use a lot of um, hybrid orbitals to describe um, the bonding in most organic molecules. You, can, you want to be able to um, describe the hybridization as sp3, sp2, or sp, depending on, you want to count the number of groups of electrons in a molecule to determine hybridization. Know how to assign hybridization to atoms. Know how the hybridization determines the geometry and the bond angle. Be able to understand the bonding in multiple bonds, both how many sigma and pi bonds are in multiple bonds, and be able to draw orbitals. We'll practice this a lot in class.